Okay, everyone, thank you for being here and welcome to today's Biz Essentials webinar. My name is Amy Stark, Director of Administration for FCSI The Americas. This Biz Essentials webinar series was created to help our consultant members run their businesses better. Biz Essentials webinars are held on the second Tuesday of every month. We've sorted through a lot of topics and identified those we think our consultant members will find beneficial, but we welcome all suggestions you may have for future webinars. Biz Essentials webinars are made possible by our corporate members. This month's sponsor is Continental Refrigerator. Energy efficient solutions with Continental Refrigerator. Recognized for innovation in energy efficient product design and an outstanding commitment to Energy Star education. Our systems combine innovation and versatility with the Continental refrigerator quality you've come to expect. Continental is not only building better units, but also smarter products, providing greater energy efficiency and reliability. In addition to converting to a greener alternative, R290 hydrocarbon refrigerant, we have researched, tested, and built into our products the highest quality, energy efficient, and sustainable components, such as compressors, condensing fans, condensing coils, expansion valve systems, evaporator coils, and motors. Continental Refrigerator also prides itself in delivering feature-rich, flexible solutions that provide real operator benefits right out of the box. has earned a reputation for innovation and excellence through our commitment to teamwork, energy efficient product strategies, and to our policy of always placing customer satisfaction above all else. Our products are American made, designed for flexibility, engineered for food safety, and tested for optimal performance. It's not just about building a product, it's about building a product that lasts in real kitchen environments. Thank you so much, Continental, for your support this, uh, this, was this week's webinar. Um, if your company would be interested in sponsoring a future webinar, please visit the webpage listed on the slide. So, I am so excited to be here with today's panelists. The discussion will be moderated by Karen Malady, FCSI. Karen has been a food service professional for 45 years, beginning with a cooking school and catering service. She founded Culinary Options in 1997 after leaving her post as food, beverage, and menu development director at Starbucks headquarters. Her goal with all clients is to help them gain clarity on what it is they are trying to create, and as a result, how to best manifest success via concept, menu, and positioning strategies. Her work with ideation and visioning sessions at the start of projects, digging deeply into the intended conceptual frameworks is unique and helps stakeholders remain focused and in alignment throughout a project. Welcome Karen and all of our panelists. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, and feel free to put the first slide up. Um, uh, and uh, well, actually, let's introduce our panelists first so everyone can see them. And, uh, you know, 45 years. Wow. I must I think I started when I was 12. Uh, so welcome uh, to everyone on, on this uh, webinar. Uh, please remember you can do Q&A uh, in that section of the webinar and uh, Wade and Amy will be fielding the questions. Uh, this panel has remained uh, dedicated to this topic with me for over two years. We have had to cancel twice, three times actually, and we're delighted to be able to do it today. So 
I would like each panelist uh, who, uh, to please introduce themselves because you are all great professionals uh, in, in our industry. Todd, why don't you start? Sure, happy to. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking some time from your day uh, to be with us today. Thanks, Continental, for your sponsorship. I'm the new guy on the panel. Um, my name is Todd Griffith. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing with a company called Mara Forney. We are a global manufacturer of brick oven cooking solutions. Uh, I have to apologize. My initial role and participation in the group changed a little bit back in April when this was going to be the boot camp uh, in Austin. I actually was with one of the top five uh, food service distributorships in the country and my role was really to bring the, the dealer perspective to the conversation. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to still be here with everyone and, and I'm honored to be with the panel group. You'll still get to address that. <laughs> Terry? Hi everyone, my name is Terry Kidwell. I am the owner of ATK Design Studios. We are a food service design company. Um, I don't want to show my age, but I've been designing commercial kitchens for 20 plus years. Uh, we are a nationally recognized certified woman owned business. We do work in the US and Canada. You name it, I've probably designed a kitchen for it. We do everything from senior living to corporate dining to higher ed to shared kitchens. Uh, so needless to say, we have a lot of different projects that require collaboration for many different clients. Excellent. Thanks, Terry. David. Yeah, hi. David Kutsunai, Managing Principal for our IA Interior Architects uh, Seattle office. Um, IA is a global interior architecture firm practicing in workplace, retail, hospitality, healthcare, education, uh, and a few other markets. Um, I've led uh, efforts for multi-location clients, such as Amazon, Microsoft, Expedia, Starbucks, Uber, JPMC, Verizon, to name a few. Um, and many of those projects included um, boutique beverage, uh, restaurant, pop-up retail, and corporate food service venues. I'm happy to participate on the conversation today. Excellent. Thanks, David. I look forward to your perspective as an architect. Mr. Benson. Uh, hello, Karen. Well, first of all, everybody needs to know it's Karen Melody's birthday today. <laughs> so let's Good just birthday. start. Let's just start there. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask all 80 attendees to sing to you, but um, <laughs> they're singing on mute. So yeah, Karen, thanks for having me on the panel. My name is Russ Benson, founder and CEO of Day One Hospitality Consulting. Uh, our firm uh, assists clients with uh, master planning, operator assessments, quality assurance assessments, guest experience analysis, and facilitation of RFPs to uh, either source a new operator or retain the current operator for the client. I've uh, been on the consulting side for seven years. Prior to that, I was on the food service operator side for eight years and then a client liaison for 10 years prior to that and then seven years of uh, hotels and restaurants. So um, uh, I've sat in uh, many different seats and I'm glad to share my perspective today. Great. So you've had various uh, 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 versions of who the client is throughout your career. That's for sure. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, Let's go ahead and go to the first slide, uh, Amy. And uh, the, uh, my, my first uh, thought about this two and a half years ago when I submitted for, the, I believe, the NAFM symposium was, uh, where's Waldo? And uh, I thought that this, this represented um, uh, a very important uh, element of what we all face today in the food service industry. Some might call it fragmented. I think at times I agree with that. And really the goal of this panel is to discuss how that fragmentation occurs and what we can do about it. When I first uh, heard a fellow design consultant in FCSI several years ago on the planning committee for the, for the, uh, that was held in Minnesota, um, he said, boy, you know, these, these projects are so complicated today. One wonders sometimes who's the client. And I thought to myself, what an odd thing to say, because at that time I was mostly involved with a, a smaller commercial projects and it was very obvious to me who the client was. It was the operator owner. Now that I've become far more in, uh, involved in non-commercial in the last 10 years, I now understand 
the question of who's the client and where's the client uh, throughout a project is a very key point of discussion that I have hoped to have uh, for many years, actually. So Amy, go ahead and advance. Um, we put together as a panel, and this by no means probably covers everything. And I'm not gonna dwell on this because we're going to come back to it very shortly. And I'm gonna ask everyone on this panel to address who they think the client is and who they end up dealing with throughout a project. But when you look at a list like this, which is not an atypical list for many non-commercial projects, you begin to see just how many stakeholders are involved in a project, how many viewpoints there are, and how potentially not all stakeholders are in alignment with each other uh, at the beginning or throughout a project. So we're gonna get back to this in a second. So go ahead, Amy, and advance uh, the slide. Why are we having this webinar? Well, we're having this webinar because I think it's a critical topic to helping our industry become more collaborative and, and deliver more successful results uh, with our, our projects uh, and more satisfactory uh, results. The Project Management Institute research tells us uh, that 60% of projects do not deliver to the client vision or achieve optimal results that might have been expected from the project. Their, their reasons, uh, as they did their research, the ones that came forward were three, the project stakeholders are not in alignment, the project stakeholders do not understand each other's roles, or third, have entered the project late without any explanation of what the, the vision uh, initially was. A uh, key definition of stakeholders is those with vested interest in the project outcome. And David, I know you're going to address how important it is to figure out who those people are early on. The definition, and I think this is an important definition, and I looked up many versions of how do you define client. The person who defines and sets the parameters for the services of the project who owns the project at hand and pays for the service. So one solution uh, would appear to be that all stakeholders must from the outset hear the same directives regarding goals and processes and budget from the client, project client. Okay, so there's that key word, client. All right, go ahead and advance, um, Amy. So it would appear to me and to this panel that some of the key questions before us as we go through this webinar, do we need to get better at identifying the key client and their vision? Or, and, do we consider all the stakeholders in a project as the client? Or, and, do we need to get better at being collaborative team players for a shifting client and stakeholder group throughout a project. Okay, with that, Amy, let's bring that, that busy slide back up. And um, David, uh, simply because many people uh, on this webinar, uh, designers get their work from architects, I would love for you to start this discussion uh, because you, you have some very critical viewpoints on this. Yeah, this is an important topic for us. Um, you know, as, as the change in the world, and we all, we're all seeing this today, right, is accelerating uh, at immense uh, speeds, right? And, and how do we accommodate that, right? That it's more and more current expertise needs to be required for the kinds of complex projects we're asked to deliver. Right? Thus, with so many experts on projects, uh, and many of us who bring in other experts to the project, it's easy to lose sight of who the client is and who, resp who is responsible for whom. Uh, in addition, most of our work on our side for us uh, in the corporate realm um, has multi-headed, multi-tiered clients on their side, right? So you you get the picture, how complicated this can start to become. 
who leads, who approves, who pays, uh, who owns, who wins, uh, and in the end, for those of us on this call, on this webinar, right, who eats? Um, and so who, who is the client? Uh, for the architects on the project, we need to answer this as soon as we can, because it starts to help us define what success will look like for that project. Um, sometimes we can try to identify who the client is by simply asking, how do, how do we get our work? Who's giving us the work, right? And for us, we get our work in three ways. Uh, the architect, usually uh, we win the work. Um, we go out, sometimes it's an RFP or some kind of design competition, but we have to go win it. Um, second way is we're given the work. Uh, that's, that's kind of really good when you can be given the work, uh, whether you're on an account and you're proving yourself to get more and more, or sometimes you have such a strong third party endorsement that a client is willing to just give you the work. Um, the best kind of work we find though, is the work that we generate. Um, we generate the work uh, and, and by that I mean we can offer sometimes a compelling business case to offer uh, expanded services. But the best of all comes from um, when we can, an opportunity where we can present a provocative idea that leads to new opportunities. Uh, and that's where uh, it's the work that no one saw coming. And that leads, usually requires innovation, creativity, and all of us here uh, on the call today uh, needs to leverage all of our expertise. Because we can collectively try to shape our future or simply sit back and wait for it to shape us, right? And David, would you say then on this list of many people, I can see where you would uh, touch a lot of these folks throughout a project is typically your primary client the owner of the facility the, the yeah. owner tenant of the facility so you're you're up here with the whole building uh, to take into consideration okay sure. great now Terry on this list who is typically your client, and, and, I, and, and I want you to be really forthright about this, because again, it's easy to say the operator, but I know you've got projects where there isn't one, and you've been hired by the architect who's paying you, mm -hmm. so go for it. Yes, so correct, a lot of times we are hired by the architect who's paying, paying us, um, but you know, it, for instance, David, he knows that his owner, his client is asking for food service in the building. So now David has to put a team together to design a cafe. So that's, you know, in turn, David's client now becomes my client because we're designing for this owner. So that's, you know, wonderful position for us to be in. Um, but I love this slide because really there's a number on this list, number of people on this list who have, we've been able to call our clients. Um, and I like to use the funnel analogy because if you can imagine this funnel and you're, you know, you're pouring in an owner's culture, you're pouring in the architect's vision boards, you're dropping in the operator's uh, menu and concepts and coffee ideas, and then you have the, even have the building that's influencing. So all of these are informing the food service component for us. So then we as kitchen designers we're filtering all of this so then at the bottom of this funnel you know we produce a design a kitchen design that's hopefully aligning with all of these you know goals and direction that's provided to us okay wow gee it's not complicated at all is it okay um, I'm, I'm debating whether to go with you, Todd, or, or, or Russ. I think I'm, I'm going to go with Russ first, uh, partly Russ, because I know in the work that uh, we do as MAS consultants, sometimes it's very important to define who's the client and who's not the client. Uh, so go for it. Yeah, so in, 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 in my world, so on this list here, uh, the sixth bullet down, I'm, I'm the MAS consultant which stands for Management Advisory Services Consultant. Um, my client is the, the owner rep, the client liaison, the program manager, where you know, Dave's client may be the building owner or the you know, VP of global real estate or, or whatnot. 
my client is that food program manager who is tasked with managing the food service program. So, you know, however, everybody else on this list, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to think of in one big, happy, collaborative family of being all clients and customers. Um, because look, we're all in the hospitality business, right? In some way, shape or form. And, and we need each other for all of us to be successful in any, any given project. Um, you know, sourcing the food service operator, whether it's before or during or right before the building opens, um, adds another whole level of complexity that we'll, we'll dive into deeper, Karen. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, who I partner with on my projects, it's that third bullet point, you know, 90% of my interactions with that program manager, again, while collaborating with architect, owner, equipment contractors, design consultants like Terry, um, at the bottom, HR, IT, purchasing, they're all part of the project. Um, Especially but, with technology being such a huge piece these days. Yeah, we could, we could do a whole hour just on that. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, so, so Karen, that's really where my focus is, is that uh, uh, partnering with that program manager and helping them set the vision and the programming concept development, and then eventually uh, operator selection. Excellent. Okay. Now, Todd, you get to play two roles here. <laughs> You've been on the dealer side. You've actually also been an operator, and you're you're now uh, with a manufacturer. Who's your client? So it's a great question, um, <clears throat> and I'll answer the. the but I believe the dealer perspective to be first, if I can, um, because I think the dealer role is, is more an engagement with execution, um, not necessarily with planning, although as the project progresses, the dealer can contribute and provide input and feedback based upon some of the challenges that the project may run into on scope. Um, the, the, deal, the, the easy question is, or the, the answer is, um, you know, the client is whoever we have a signed contract with. Uh, the client is whoever is paying us because I have a fiduciary responsibility to that party. But at the same time, uh, the interaction with uh, the GC is critical. The interaction with um, the manufacturer is critical. The interaction with the consultant, be it MAS or design, are critical and it's not uncommon that as you look at brand standards and relationships uh, with facilities management companies, um, the contractors, you know, those are all relationships that come into play. So we're in a similar position. We have a lot of clients on this list and it's almost time dependent upon when you come into, when you come into the project, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, when you come in at the back end, I think there is a big challenge there because I think there's a dilution of the vision uh, that takes place from the original concept um, down through execution. So I think that contributes to the 60% challenge rate that we see with, with satisfaction on, on the projects. Um, as the manufacturer, again, I think that the obligation we have is to many folks on this list uh, because it's not just the one and done project. This is an organic opportunity for the company to grow. Uh, this is all about future business, not the isolated project that we're necessarily working on and involved with. So, um, you know, you have to make a decision. Is this a transactional opportunity or is this a long-term lifelong customer that we're looking for to develop? So that's kind of how we would come at it. It's interesting that you use the word customer, and I used to have the definition on this, the difference between a customer and a client. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we, we use a lot of words in our industry, client, stakeholder, end user, et cetera. And uh, what I've discovered in working with this panel and with many, many people on projects over the years is that our definition of certain words are not always the same. Uh, David, what, uh, I think, what's your definition of the end user? This is a two-part question, it's a trick. Uh, <laughs> what's your definition of the end user? 
and where do you feel in most projects things begin to fragment and why? Yeah, for, for us, the, the end user usually is not the client, the formal client, uh, right? So the, the client, as we look at formally, is the one who hires us uh, and pays our paycheck. Um, the, uh, the end user or the customer, I guess, uh, is the person who's actually sitting there and using the space. Uh, you know, um, using the, the desk, using the conference room, using the table to eat at. Um, so the, the end user is the customer for us. Okay, all right. Russ, who's the end user in your world? Uh, it's the person paying and eating the food. I mean, that's, uh, you know, again, as an MES consultant, we're, we're kind of driving this vision um, with a heavy emphasis on customer journey and guest experience. Uh, that's through, you know, again, menu development, concept development, uh, peer review on design. So, uh, you know, MAS consultants are not design consultants, but we, we add value and peer review. Uh, so yeah, that end user, that's the lighthouse for us that we always have to keep um, in our crosshairs because yeah, you know, the whole process of you know, again from visioning to operator selection um, is is intended to be in the best interest of the person who orders a turkey sandwich and pays for it. And how about you, Terry? <clears throat> so yeah, for me, um, you know, the end user is actually I see it as two different people um, because it has to be functional for an operator to use. So we have to design a functional space. Uh, and we want the cafe to be an enjoyable experience, as Russ is saying, for, you know, the consumer the, and, and David, the person that's the customer that's eating at the cafe, right? Because those folks are coming here to eat every day, but the operator's coming here to work every day. This is their work environment. This is the place that they need to feel comfortable, where they need to make and prepare the food. So, you know, to me, it's both of them. And, you know, with kitchen design, it, it really is the ultimate form and function marriage, right? It has to be more functional and it has to have a nice form. For, you know, right. Vision. Which must be a challenge when there isn't an operator or a concept or a menu. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's <laughs> tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it can be. But I mean, we, you know, we pride ourselves in designing for flexibility. And so, you know, we use our experience to produce what we, what we lovingly refer to as universal layouts. Because, you know, no matter what, every operator is different and every chef is gonna be different. So if, you, if someone's reviewing a floor plan, there, there will always be someone that likes to do it a certain way, uh, as we all do, like your kitchen at home, right? You, you like your particular layout. Um, but once an operator is brought on board, we do our best to make small changes if we can, you know, to help that process. Well, especially with all the innovation and equipment these days, I would think it gets more and more challenging to know where to introduce certain smart equipment, multifunctional equipment for space reduction, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, Todd, uh, talk to us a little bit about who your end user is. Again, from the perspective of the manufacturer now, and who your end user was when you were on the dealer side. So it's, it's kind of a literal definition, I think, from the manufacturer side. Uh, the end user is the, the person or individual that's actually using the equipment, performing the task of the operation. Um, we become a support role. Uh, post installation so that the experience can be delivered and that's where I kind of separate to Terry's point the customer versus the consumer because they're two very different things obviously the goal of, of the concept is that we enhance a consumer experience uh, and we maximize that because that allows for success of, of the project and, and the long-term outcome um, but but my operator are the are the, the contract management companies the, the site management team and the folks that are actually hands-on working with the, the equipment to deliver the product to the consumer. Um, I think on the dealer perspective there, um, it, it's fairly similar in terms of, of the definition and the scope. 
Um, but the customer becomes again more the the operating company delivering the message because or delivering the the, the concept because um, we have to support the, the vision we have to support the integrity of the design so again that the end result is is what was intended and do you think that typically happens uh, I, I think there's a lot of challenges with that I, I think that I, I think there there are a lot of disciplines that are at odds for a variety of reasons. Um, I think there's there's a mentality with with many that is kind of a this is what I do and I follow the I, I follow the terms of the contract no more no less, which can be a challenge. Um, I, th I think that uh, there's a lack of long term engagement through the process. Um, that can impact the outcome as well. And, and there's kind of a stay in your lane mentality. There's some control issues. You know, you said you wanted the call to be somewhat controversial. There are relational issues with, with the disciplines. I think there's, there are trust issues. I think there are accountability issues. I think that this is a great conversation to have, but this is the start of the conversation and the dialogue has to continue. Um, that's why I'm excited to be a part of this. Well, I appreciate that, Todd, and I think it is a conversation uh, very much uh, needed, and the timing is ripe uh, in the industry, especially now with everyone having to shift and rethink. And, you know, it seems to me that it, it's an ideal time to really look at new models and new ways of being, to really flip that percentage of unsuccessful or, or lack of ideal success projects to, uh, to more of them turning out exactly as we had envisioned them. Now, so David, it all seems so obvious in this discussion, right? That you figure out who the stakeholders are, you bring them together, you get them in alignment. What goes, what goes sideways and how do we prevent it? Well, the process is, is the key thing. And, um, some people call it design build process. Um, we like to call it the integrated design process. Um, sometimes design build means really you have to build it. You have to design it the way they want to build it. Um, but the, but the integrated process really brings as many of the expertise and experts uh, up front on a project. So whoever has control of managing and sitting in course, the process right up front um, as much as possible if they can put into action an integrated design process that identifies who are all the players that are required how do we engage them early so we can really leverage everyone's expertise in the big room from day one um, we usually get um, everything out on the table we usually get to the best answer uh, we usually uncover opportunities for innovation and creativity uh, and provide new solutions in that kind of process versus a design bid usually you're starting to string along and engage the experts one after another after another after another and in that process sometimes something set in course by one uh, part partner early on uh, negates some of the opportunities that another partner being brought on through a bid process later in the game, right, has to offer. So um, you usually are in a sacrifice mode uh, where, or a compromise mode where, shoot, this would have been great, but too late. That's already embedded in the slab or whatever, right? Right, right. Well, so, so in your case, David, it sounds like you, the architect, would be the person responsible for bringing this group of, of uh, stakeholders together. Uh, Terry, I've seen, I've heard a lot of designers say that often what, I don't want to say goes wrong, but what can cause extra frustration and confusion is they are not brought in. You are not brought in uh, in a timely manner to a project uh, where you could have had better input and insights that, that might have uh, swayed the design or the programming in a different manner. Have you had that experience? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we're brought in a lot of times during 
tenant improvement versus shell and core. So the building's already there. Um, you know, the floors are already poured. And now we're looking, you know, what's above us, what's below us, you know, what's around us. So the building truly starts to dictate food service. So sometimes there are limitations on what you can offer because of that. And, and then Ross, um, I know you have some thoughts about, um, you know, in, this, in essence, the whole ideation and visioning process that we are often involved in with regards to a renovated or new facility and the extent to which the operator might be involved versus not be involved. I think it would be important uh, for you to share your perspective on that. Yeah, it, 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 it is a, a, a tricky piece of the jigsaw puzzle here because I think it really depends, Karen. I mean, if, if you have a blank canvas and you're building a new building and there isn't any existing food service, um, you know, then, then there's pros and cons to bringing the operator in, you know, six months before go live or one month before go live. Um, and, you know, the, the, the pros to that is, oh, okay, great. Now we have, you know, everybody in the room and that's awesome and we're going to design a great place. Um, but the trick there is, is that operator may be gone in three years. And at the end of the day, no matter how you slice it, it's still the owners or the clients building and facility. So, um, so, you know, when it's a renovation to your question, most likely you have an incumbent operator who is going to be um, more engaged in a renovation of an existing space, providing it does not uh, run concurrently with an RFP. So sometimes a renovation of a space may initiate an RFP to either find a new operator or just um, really start over with your current operator and begin the visioning process there. So uh, not, not a perfect science, certainly not an easy answer to the question because no two, no two projects are alike, uh, but certainly pros and cons to having the operator in uh, too early or too late. But it's really kind of on a project by project scenario. So Todd, I know we've talked over the years about um, the, you know, the typical conflict points between consultants and dealers. And it just seems to be kind of an unending conversation. Uh, one that I hope one day uh, can be resolved uh, in a peaceful manner. Uh, but given that, and, and that you have had that experience also, where, where do you think in a, within a project, the confines of a project, where do those conflicts typically come up and how can they be resolved? Sure, uh, another great question and that takes you down a whole different rabbit hole. Um, the, the industry, as you know, since I've been in it has been defined as fragmented and, and people can put their own label on what that means. Um, each of the disciplines has a role, I think, we're getting better in some cases, but seldom is it collaborative. And, and there's a great opportunity there, I think, for um, for the the, the the team that we had on that sheet in front of us here to really start to engage each other and work together, understand each other's business. Before I joined um, the distributorship, I, I think I was naive to, to a lot of um, aspects of the business. And in a large extent of that was financial. Um, because we, we thought that, you know, there was a customer ownership issue, that there was a, uh, this is a, man, a manufacturer perspective now, um, that, that all the money was, was in one place. And, and I think that, you know, a big challenge of what drives projects sideways is the big financial question. Um, larger dealers today, larger national dealers today have stepped away from a lot of the contracts bid process because of the fact that there's no money in it anymore. Um, when you look at margins and you look at the bid process and you look at dealers that carry significant overhead and investment in their business competing with others that maybe don't have the same level uh, and it becomes a price war to win the business, I think people are starting to step away. That's creating now the design build dealer as the industry consolidates and 
uh, people are questioned, segments are questioned about what value do reps bring, what value do designers bring, what value do dealers bring, what value do manufacturers bring. I think we're starting to see some of the, the melding of some of the disciplines where, uh, where they're, they're integrating. Um, we have consultants being hired by dealers in some cases that had a business of their own at one point to be able to offer the service. Dealers are offering value-added services in, in many cases with CAD support. And many of those dealers are working with and for consultants, kind of picking up work that's overflow maybe that, that some of the consultants have or smaller jobs where they can focus on larger projects. Great opportunity for the two to kind of get together and see how they can support one another and if there's an opportunity to grow the business together there. Um, but when money becomes the driving factor of, of me walking away at a profit or a loss, I think that the challenge later in the scope of the work becomes, can I substitute, you know, as a dealer? Is there a product that will fulfill the same function as a commodity that maybe I can do better with another manufacturer? And that's when you start to see, I think, the integrity of a lot of the projects go sideways. The challenge is we base everything on the price today. We, we, you know, I hate the two letters VE. I've always hated VE, uh, value engineering, uh, and I and I realize it's become a standard component of just about every project out there. Not always driven by the owner, not always driven by the consultant. Uh, in a lot of cases, driven by the GC. So we start to lose control over the process there a little bit. But uh, when when we have to look for um, ways to find money. Um, that, that creates a challenge. I remember being in a, a consultant's office in upstate New York, looking at a picture he had on the wall and it was a yacht and at the back of the yacht it was a small dinghy tied to the back of it. And on the dinghy was a sign that said original contract and on the yacht was a sign that said change order. Um, that doesn't help the cause, that doesn't help the vision. Um, we've got to find a way to bring value back. We've got to find a way to de-emphasize uh, the, the, the money and, and do due diligence to quality. I mean, I think every design consultant on, on, on the uh, meeting here knows who does a good job, knows who has a great reputation, knows who can execute, execute their work and their vision. Um, and because it's an open bid process that creates some of the challenges. Oh boy, what a, what a challenge we have. And, and again, uh, you know, Amy, I want to thank FCSI for the opportunity to bring this conversation uh, uh, to people. Uh, I think that this is literally something that probably needs a series because you can see how much depth there is uh, and how much cr cr critical content there is in this discussion. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that uh, w we would love to hear, are there questions coming in? Okay, so before we take them, real quickly, I want to go around to each of you, and if you could, in a very few sentences, how, how, what's the solution here in an ideal world, what would you say, David? What do we need to do to, you know, turn this, this corner of 60% mm -hmm. not meeting expectation? Yeah, it's... Um... I think a lot of us usually when we have that kind of question tossed at us, uh, we try to, uh, it goes quickly first and foremost to, we have to better educate our clients. They don't understand what it takes to design, what it takes to procure, what it takes to build, what it takes to implement, uh, what, what they're asking for, right? The fact of the matter is um, there, we, we had a chance to do it when their world, the client's world, change happened slower than the time it took for us to implement a project for them. Uh, that whole thing is flipped, especially now today. Their world is changing faster than it takes for us to deliver uh, a space and a venue for them, right? Uh, and so there's, no, there's really no chance to, to better educate them, to slow them down for the way we learned how to do our work. We have to change the game by becoming innovative, uh, taking a quantum step here forward and understanding the client's world, re-understanding the client's world to reinvent and innovate a new process, a new way to deliver, a new way to offer food that wants to constantly change, a new way to procure all of those, the equipment that's needed. Um, we, I think the task is on us now to rethink 
what we do. Great answer, Russ. Well, so, you know, it, go, it starts with visioning, Karen. I mean, if, you better have a plan, right? If, if you come in too late or if you build the plane at 30,000 feet, it's not gonna fly very well. So have a plan, have a vision and, and define why do you even have food service in the first place? Is it an amenity? Is it a convenience? I mean, how does it, how does it fit into your workplace strategy? Is it going to be subsidized? I mean, you right. know, sub subsidy versus P&L influences menus and concepts and programming and design and operator selection, right? That's just one little uh, example of, of the importance of defining a plan. Yeah, you know, it makes a huge difference. You're absolutely right. Terry? So Karen, like you said before, you know, a lot of times as the kitchen designer, we're onboarded later in the process. So, you know, us as a group, ATK, um, you know, we recognize that we need to help and we need to get up to speed pretty quick on projects to help make this all come together. So what we've done is, you know, we're, we're working to produce checklists. It's a living document. We keep adding to it anything that comes up and we distribute that so that items don't get missed or they're items that have been miscommunicated in the in the past. So we're trying to unveil, <laughs> so to speak, some of these, you know, you know, missteps from the design side. And then we also recognize, you know, as designers, we're very visual people. So we can see a lot of times we see the space in 3D where most people, they, they can't see that, right? You, you, don't, you don't see, you can't read black and white floor plans. So what we do is we're continuing to refine the experience to everybody on this list on how we review documents. So for instance, you know, we're virtually walking through the space piece by piece so that you're not seeing it in a black and white format, you're literally seeing it in a 3D, you're seeing this it in the space. You know, and we're opening cabinet doors to show possible storage areas. So we're we're rethinking how we present to the clients, to everybody, so that they can understand better what they're getting. So they're not surprised when they get to the job site and it and it is what you know was on the floor plan. That's great. That's great. And Todd, um, for me, I, I to make it as short would say. Um, all of the disciplines to take a vested interest in the project. There's so many resources and so much talent um, within the stakeholders that are all part of, of the work. And, and when you can when you can open um, Pandora's box and and and, and get the, the full value of those resources, um, and everyone's engaged and collaborative, um, I, I think that the outcome becomes to the positive 60 rather than the, the negative 60. Fabulous. Well, again, I want to thank you all for these insights. And Amy, let's let's take some questions. Okay. Um, we have one from Christina that follows um, right on, on Todd, since you're the last one to speak. How can equipment manufacturers help mitigate common challenges? Um, boy, I'd like to get more specific to the, to the question. Um, I think information that's provided, education that's provided, you know, as far as the, the manufacturer consultant um, engagement would be to make sure that specifications are updated, that the information and the data is accurate, um, that, that application is understood as well as the physical specifications of a product. There, there are some manufacturers that, you know, as cold as it sounds, are commodity products that serve a role in in the kitchen um, and there are other products that are more specific to the vision and the customer experience um, so you really have to kind of define the scope of, of what product is you know going where but i think a lot of communication and information is is important there and carrie from a design perspective you might want to answer that you know just what what makes it easiest for you to work effectively with a manufacturer uh, well, for us, it's the sales reps that are, you know, there when we need them. Um, and, you know, I'm going to say this lovingly, that aren't, um, aren't begging to see us every five minutes, right? Like we, <laughs> when we email you and we have a question, it's, it's great to have the answers. Okay, excellent. Any more questions? Uh, uh, David, would you, do you have a perspective on that? 
Uh, no, is there other another question I could tackle? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if not, I'm going to have you. Uh, I'll ask you one. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we did have one. Uh, I'm, this one's for Terry. What do you find is the best tool to walk through and review service designs with the client? Oh, now I have to give away my trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we actually use a couple different programs. Um, we really like Revit and one it's because visually we're not competing with the architectural finishes because, you know, when you start to see these in 3D, you know, it, you start to take it literally. So we don't necessarily want to show the space as in, as in, hey, this is the finishes because it might change. So we like to use the SketchUp version in order to just get, walk through the space. Here's a piece of equipment. Um, you know, we put that into PowerPoint, do pop-ups and, and virtually walk through the space. Any other questions, Amy? Um, yeah. Um, what kind of change in the professionals list is changing after the pandemic? Oh boy, that's a doozy. And a great question, uh, and, yeah. and I know we're all sick of the word COVID, pandemic, pivot, and you name it, but David, I know you've got some, you know, you kind of address this really. I mean, this has changed everything in terms of timelines, et cetera. Why don't you take that one? And then Russ, I'd like you to address that from an operations programming standpoint. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're we like to call it, uh, aggressively waiting right now. Uh, and then we're aggressively looking at all of the different, as many different scenarios as po possible, uh, of which way, you know, the world will go, uh, and, and probably in a lot of different directions, as we're starting to find out with our clients. Um, but be ready to, to run ahead uh, when they're at the right time for them. So, um, I think with it, with regards to food service, uh, a lot of our large clients are starting to rethink that and contemplate what that should be. Um, some already have eliminated that out of their um, their projects um, because it's um, they're in cost cutting measures and they think a lot of their folks will be working from home instead. Uh, others are are really doubling down and saying no, the the office or the campus is the place that they want their people to be. It will be the healthiest place. It'll be the best place. It'll be the happiest place for them to do their work. Um, and for culture and engagement and all of these other things to thrive uh, to, for productivity and creativity and innovation, people need to be together. So while there's gonna be less people probably all together at the same time uh, with choice being provided now, that the world knows that people can work uh, elsewhere. Um, the facility itself is gonna, I think, have a lot more value. So when we start to look at the food service venues, those are key components to culture driving uh, places, right? Place making, experience making. And so for the food service side of the equation, how, first off, how can it be done in a safe way so that the customers trust it uh, and they come back to it. And then beyond uh, the pandemic, can it be turned into um, a lot of other things other than just food? So it becomes multi-purpose. And we're all starting to see some of that already, but I think it's gonna amp itself up. Uh, okay, yeah, I, 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 I'm glad to get that architectural perspective because again, this has impact on the entire building. Uh, Russ, what are, what are, you know, just from an operational programming standpoint, I know we've seen a lot of shifts. <laughs> How would you answer that? Yeah, I, I really love what Dave said, because I, I think, you know, uh, the power of food is going to have uh, more of an impact tomorrow than, than ever before. Yep, the spaces are going to shrink. Yep, 30% of people are going to continue to work from home. Uh, we all understand that, but but workplace amenities are going to be um, uh, you know, really paramount uh, just to drive the socialization and networking from uh, inside the workplace, socially distanced in some capacity. 
but I also believe it's, it's, you know, yeah, we know self-service is out the window right now, but I'm of the belief that it's going to come back in nine to 12 months. We'll be doing, you know, um, salad bars and self-service again, because the menu velocity reports tell us that's what people want. So, you know, again, we can talk about the customer journey piece, um, but, you know, operationally, it's uh, food is going to play a big role. Dave touched on productivity. You know, we know that folks spend 22 minutes more away from their desk if they eat off site. So that productivity algorithm shows a, a big ROI if you have a compelling reason to, for people to stay on site and, and food is going to be you know, the pixie dust that brings people back together and rejuvenates the workplace. It's uh, interesting, and again, from a, both an equipment, Todd, and design, Terry, a viewpoint, uh, I know many of, of our design friends are, are essentially saying they haven't been asked yet by a lot of uh, major clients to, to change too much in terms of design, even for new. Uh, and yet I see every day uh, Burger King totally reinvented their design. Taco, I mean, it's endless, totally different designs, technologically driven, contactless driven. I mean, huge design changes. Uh, and I'm imagining probably as many in the kitchen, in the back of house. What is your viewpoint on design shifts as a result of COVID and post COVID? Yeah, we're not, you know, again, just like the other consultants you've talked to, we're not seeing being asked too much yet. Um, it's mostly flexibility in food shields, right? So that to Russ's point, you can go back to a self-serve model if that's what you're, you know, wanting to do. Um, and for the time being, it's a served model. If it is a sal if it is a salad bar on site, there's composed salads inside, you know, that you can still grab. Um, I don't think most people are back to work yet. So, you know, the it's a social distancing thing. Um, order pay kiosks because you're touching things. You want to be, you know, distanced from each other. It's just strategically placing those. Maybe more ordering online, more ordering apps versus at the stations. That's kind of what we're seeing. But we've okay. always had a strict food service, you know, sanitation rules and stuff for food service. So <laughs> NSF yeah. and health codes and... <laughs> No kidding. I mean, Todd, how's, how do you see, uh, from a manufacturer's perspective, of uh, design of equipment, types of equipment, et cetera, emerging as preferential after COVID? Well, I see a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of changes front and back of house. Um, manufacturing, to, to the extent that it can, obviously wants to go as touchless as possible. Um, food safety and food handling are paramount. A lot of that's driven by best practice and, and really our, uh, our consumer now wanting to see how their food's being prepared and served. Um, there's, there's been a blurring of, of some extent between back and front of house where the space continues to get smaller. Uh, that's not a, an uncommon challenge. Um, Production flow and streamlining is still paramount from an efficiency perspective. Variety of food and authenticity of food is still important to the consumers. So we still will come out of COVID with labor challenges. Um, we still will come out of COVID with the same spatial challenges, I think. Technology will continue to drive uh, manufacturing and, and uh, application. So we're already kind of on a path that's, that's already going that direction. This is just front focus back, I think, to some of those areas. Well, I'm sure, Amy, that we're, oh, I just hate this, that we're probably running out of time. And please, uh, everyone who has uh, uh, sent in a question, I know everyone on the panel is more than willing to answer those in email format, um, very much so, all of us. Uh, because this is this is a really a critical discussion and one that has so many tentacles uh, that I hope we have opportunities to to have more of these. I, I really do. Was, was, is there time for one more question? I honestly don't know. No, we're out of time. Uh, we're right at time. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap everything up. But thank you, Karen, Russ, Todd, Terry, and David. 
Uh, thank you, Continental Refrigerator, and thanks all of you for joining us today. We'd love to hear from you how we can improve these, so please fill out the survey that you'll get when you finish up. And um, remember, these Biz Essential webinars are happening every second Wednesday of the month. So we'll see you the next one on October 14th. Um, that one's called Put the Power in Your Virtual Presentation, sponsored by BOF Corporation and Ally Group. Thank you guys again, and everybody have a great day. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.